I need to be out of town today, but we also need to push on in the dialogue. And so I'm coming to you this morning through the miracle of television. Uh, and like HBO, there will be no interruptions for commercials. You remember now, uh, in the dialogue, Plato asks Cephalus what is justice. And Cephalus gives Plato the definition that was making the rounds. Namely, justice is telling the truth and paying your debts. Now let me make a note of that. Justice. Telling the truth and paying your debts. All right. I want you to keep in mind also that the word justice functions to identify three different concepts or three different uh, uh, references. It refers, first of all, to a principle, the principle of justice. It refers also to a virtue, the virtue of justice. And it refers to a state of affairs. And we say that uh, this is a just state of affairs. We sometimes say uh, this was an unjust thing to do. So the word just, the word justice, are used in these three contexts. And you need to keep that in mind, uh, especially since Plato sometimes shifts from one reference uh, to another. Sometimes he uh, talks about a principle, the principle of justice, and sometimes he talks about the virtue of justice. And when he asks Cephalus what justice is, and Cephalus says that it's uh, telling the truth and paying your debts, obviously what Cephalus is giving to Plato, what he's giving to Socrates in the dialogue, is a, a statement of the principle of justice. You must keep in mind also, as we proceed now in the dialogue, the analysis of normative language that we completed at our last meeting. You remember now that whenever normative language is used, implicit in that use are two parts of meaning. There's a descriptive part and a prescriptive part. When Cephalus says that justice is paying your debts and telling the truth, what he's doing is giving to Socrates the descriptive part of the concept or of the principle of justice. Moreover, you need to keep in mind that for the Greeks, the principle of justice was the all-encompassing moral principle. It is the highest of all moral principles. And as Plato uses the notion, it does in fact encompass all other moral principles. And you need to keep that in mind as Plato talks about justice. When we get to Aristotle, we'll restrict, as Aristotle does, the meaning of the principle of justice uh, so that it does not encompass all other moral principles. But uh, for, for now, you must keep in mind uh, that it does. All right, let's, let's take a look at the text. Page eight. Uh, here, uh, Socrates is, is, is discussing with uh, uh, Cephalus uh, the ramifications, uh, some of the implications of the definition of justice that Cephalus has given to him. And uh, there in that bottom paragraph, he talks about uh, what is due, and he talks about the debts which he owes to men, and says that uh, uh, being wealthy relieves him of the temptations uh, to be in the debt uh, of, of other people. So we have before us now a definition of justice, which was making the rounds. It was the definition of Simonides, as uh, Socrates has made clear here. And now Socrates wants to take a look at it. What Socrates is going to do is to analyze this concept, analyze this um, characterization of the principle of justice that Cephalus has given to him. What Socrates wants to know is whether or not 
this definition holds water. Whether this definition of the all-encompassing moral principle, keeping in mind how normative language works, whether or not this definition holds water. All right, Socrates says, uh, let's, let's do just that. And he gives an example of, uh, of someone paying a debt. And then he asks Cephalus, as a matter of fact, he uh, asks Polemarchus, uh, because uh, Cephalus is now back out of the argument and, and Polemarchus takes over. He asks Cephalus and Polemarchus whether or not a, a given episode of a human being paying a debt to another human being counts as an instance of justice. He says, suppose that um, uh, uh, a friend uh, should uh, ask one to uh, keep his arms uh, for a while, that the friend would come and claim them later. Let, let's bring the example up to date. Suppose that um, a friend of yours should come to you and say, uh, look here, I'm going to be gone over the weekend, and uh, I have this high-powered uh, hunting rifle, uh, which I'm very reluctant to, to leave at home while I'm away. Uh, may I leave it with you? Uh, I'd like to come back on Monday and, and pick it up. And you, because he's a friend, because you are gracious and generous, say, I'll be glad to do that. So your friend leaves his rifle with you. It is clearly his rifle, and you have agreed to return it to him on Monday. Now, when Monday rolls around, your friend appears to claim his rifle. But suppose that, in the meantime, your friend has gone berserk. Suppose that uh, he has lost his mind over the weekend, all right? And he comes back now to claim his high-powered rifle. He says, please let me have it back. I'm going to uh, go up into the, bell, into the bell tower and uh, pick off co-eds. All right? Now, ought you to return the rifle to him? Remember the conditions. It is clearly his rifle. You owe it to him. It is not yours. It is his. Moreover, you have agreed to return it to him when he comes to claim it. Surely this is a clear-cut case of paying a debt. You, it is, you, it is his due. You owe it to him. You must, you must uh, on this principle, uh, re return the debt. Would it be just to return it? Well, here on page 9, the bottom of page 9, uh, everybody agrees that, uh, on the contrary, it would be unjust to return the rifle to its proper owner under these circumstances. And I, I, I presume that, that you would agree. But why? Uh, are you just <laughs> making this up? Is this just a whim? Uh, is it just your subjective judgment? This is what you would like? Well, <laughs> If our analysis of normative language, if our analysis of normative concepts, of normative terms, of which justice is one, uh, is to be of any value to us, then we need to invoke that analysis now in deciding whether or not uh, to repay this debt, that the debt of the rifle, under these circumstances, constitutes an instance of justice, where justice is a normative term. Well, I think that the reason that we reject uh, the uh, return of the rifle under these circumstances as an instance of justice is that we know that part of any normative concept, and certainly part of any moral concept, is that the well-being of human beings must be respected. You remember that in establishing the standards by which we make any normative claim at all, and certainly a moral claim, 
uh, the way that we establish these standards is one, by making reference to the nature of the thing being judged, the nature of the circumstance, uh, this kind of thing. And two, respect for human well-being. I think it is quite clear that if we should return the rifle under these circumstances, we would not be respecting the well-being of the co-eds whom he intends to pick off from the bell tower. And so, the definition of justice, as Cephalus has given it to us, is somehow inadequate. We, it needs to be quantified in some way. It may be altogether wrong. In fact, it's not altogether wrong. We all know that there's something to this. Uh, uh, Mr. Dale thought when I first presented this that, yeah, that was a reasonable um, uh, definition of justice. But it does need to be qualified. And, and so uh, Socrates uh, wishes to do just that. Over on page 10, it is so qualified. Look there uh, in, on the middle of the page, just opposite Jowett's marginal note. It is uh, Socrates talking. He says, Simonides then, after the manner of the poets, would seem to have spoken darkly of the nature of justice. For he really meant to say that justice is the giving to each man what is proper to him. And this he termed a debt. So now we're going to qualify this, co this uh, notion of debt and make sure that it's simply a returning of what is proper. And in the case of the rifle to the madman, that would not be a proper debt, a proper return. So now we qualify um, the concept of justice accordingly. So justice now is uh, giving what is proper, all right? Giving what is proper. And then he says, um, just below that, uh, no, excuse me, just above that, he says uh, that what is proper to give is good to one's friends and evil to, one enemy, to one's enemies. That's in the uh, paragraph immediately above. Well, as a matter of fact, it's in uh, uh, several paragraphs above. So this giving what is proper amounts to good to friends and evil to enemies. And that's what, what's proper. So uh, it's a, it is just to um, inflict punishment on the enemy in times of war, so this argument would go, uh, and, and just to do good to your friends. Well, that's where we are. So the, ju this, uh, the definition of justice as originally given to us, this business of paying debts, has now been qualified to giving what is proper, one must be sure that the debt is a proper debt. And that what is proper is good to your friends and evil to your enemies, and that's what's proper. Now what Socrates does at, at this point in the dialogue is to introduce the technical arts and sciences. The Greek word for technical arts and sciences is um, techne, T-E-C-H-N-E accent, techne. And this is a word that I'll use yet again uh, during the course of, uh, of the semester, techne. He asks, um, just below that paragraph that I read aloud. He says, by heaven I replied, and if we asked him what do or proper thing is given by medicine, and to whom, what answer do you think that he would make to us? And the, the dialogue goes on. 
And then on the top of page 11, apropos of this medicine business, uh, Socrates says, and who is best able to do good to his friends and uh, evil to his enemies in times of sickness when uh, the art and science of medicine needs to be invoked? And uh, the answer is the physician. And he says, ah, and went on a voyage amid the perils of the sea. And the answer is the pilot, who are practitioners of the appropriate technical arts and sciences. So the physician is the practitioner of medicine, and the pilot is the practitioner of the art and science of navigation. And we get a lot more examples uh, added to these. Socrates now has, has introduced, as I say, the technical arts and sciences into the argument. And why does he do it? He does it for two reasons. He wants to draw an analogy to, to a state of affairs in which the judgments that we make about that state of affairs are objective judgments. That there are rules for um, proceeding. In the case of the physician, the rules are the rules or the principles of medicine. And it is these, it is this uh, art and science, this body of rules, this body of principles that directs the physician in, uh, uh, in his activities. We say that the uh, physician practices his art and he practices his art under the science of medicine. In the activity of uh, uh, directing a, a, a ship at sea, uh, we, we call upon uh, the pilot uh, because the pilot is a practitioner of an objective set of rules, the rules of navigation. And the practitioner is guided or directed by those rules, by those principles. All right. That's one reason. He wants to be sure that, uh, uh, that the argument is kept objective, that we're going to be talking about rules and principles, that we're going to be invoking standards. There are standards for the performance of the physician those standards defined by the art and science of medicine. There are standards for the performance of the pilot, those standards established by the art and science of navigation. The second reason for introducing the technical arts and sciences is that he intends to use those arts and sciences later on in his ethics, as you will discover. It is important to observe here that in order for the physician to do, good, to do good to his friends and evil to his enemies in time of sickness, he must have knowledge of the appropriate principles that apply to that situation. And the same is true of the pilot, he must have knowledge. He must have knowledge of the appropriate principles governing his activity. What Plato is suggesting here now is that there are standards for making judgments about what is just and unjust. And that in order to decide what is just or not just, we need to have knowledge of those standards. We need to have knowledge of those principles of justice, of those rules of justice. Indeed, for the Greeks, knowledge is the key to all things. And that's something that I shall say uh, over and over again 
during the course of the semester. So here we have before us now a qualified definition of justice. Justice is now paying your debts all right, but uh, that comes to um, giving what is proper. And uh, so far, what is proper is doing good to your friends and evil to your enemies. But in order to do that, you have to have knowledge of how to do it, all right? In terms of fitness, what you would need to know uh, would be uh, the principles of medicine. At sea, you would need to know the principles of the navigation in order to do good to your friends and evil to your enemies. You might wonder why you have to have knowledge to do evil to your enemies. Well, uh, uh, if your enemy is sick, <laughs> it's the knowledge of medicine that will tell you how to do him in, uh, if, if you want to do him in. And the same is true, of course, of, of, of navigation at sea. If you want to uh, run the ship aground, you've got to know how to proceed uh, to do it. So where we are right now is where we are, uh, as I've described it here on, on the path. Over the next couple of pages, Socrates, oh, deals with some non-central, rather peripheral issues. And uh, I'd like to pass, pass over that. If you, um, uh, if you have any questions that you want to raise about pages 12 and 13, uh, you, you may do so when we meet again on Monday. He comes back to the, uh, to the main issue over here on page 14. He says, um, he says, I, I want to take a look at this good to friends, evil to enemies business a, a, a bit more. And he says, um, we want to be careful, don't we, that, um, that we don't harm people who don't deserve to be harmed. Notice, um, Oh, about a third of the way down the page there on page 14. Um, Socrates says, um, but the good are just and would not do an injustice true. Then according to your argument, it is just to uh, injure those who do no wrong. All right? Just to injure those who do no wrong. And uh, Apollo Marcus says, uh, quite right. So then Socrates says there, uh, uh, half dozen lines up from the bottom of the page. If that is so, then we want to be careful about who our friends and enemies are. We want to make sure that our friends are the good guys so that we're doing good to the good guys. And we want to be sure that our enemies are the bad guys so that we're doing evil to the bad guys. If we are mistaken in our judgment, or if we ourselves are corrupt, so that our friends are the bad guys, and our enemies are the good guys, then we end up doing good to the bad guys, and evil to the good guys, and that quite clearly is, is inappropriate. So Socrates qualifies yet further in and says, now let's, let's be clear about that. And Paul Marcus says, uh, uh, yes, let us, do. But then Socrates asks a very interesting question. Over here on page 15, uh, we have about eight lines down on page 15. Socrates says, but ought the just to injure anyone at all? Friend or enemy, good guy or bad guy, ought the just to injure anyone at all. And Socrates is going to reply to that question, no. That the just ought not injure anybody at all. 
traditionally, uh, I think, uh, in Western culture, we attribute this view as initially given by Jesus Christ. The old law, you remember, was eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, and Christ comes along and says, now turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, uh, uh, do good to your enemies. But uh, several hundred years before Christ, Socrates says, uh, ought we to injure anybody at all? And the answer is, we ought not. The argument that follows here is a, a very interesting argument and kind of a tricky one. And let's get it down, if I can move this sheet. Notice how it goes. Paul Marcus says, undoubtedly he ought to injure those who are both wicked and his enemies. And then Socrates says, uh, when horses are injured, are they improved or are they deteriorated? All right. If you do injury to some uh, animal in this case, so you injure a horse, can you see that? Suppose you injure a horse. What is the um, what is the consequence? What is the result? The answer is, uh, he says, uh, are the horses uh, improved or deteriorated? And the answer is, of course, that they are deteriorated. What kind of words are improved and deteriorated? Well, it seems to me quite clear that they are normative words. If I say that something is improved, what I'm saying is that it's gotten better. It's gotten more good. I'm making a value judgment. I'm making a normative judgment. If I say, on the other hand, that it is deteriorated, again, I am making a normative judgment. I am saying that it is becoming less good, it is becoming more bad, uh, clearly value judgments. So the result of the injury to the horse is a deterioration to the horse. A value judgment is made. The horse is less good, the horse is more bad. And then Socrates says, um, deteriorated, that is to say, in the good qualities, notice he even uses the moment word good, in the qualities of horses, not of dogs, or not of anything else, that there's a kind of deterioration that takes place here. I'm running out of room, but I must save some. We, to injure a horse is to deteriorate the horse qua, qua horse, all right? Qua meaning as. So I injure the horse, I do him injury as a horse, qua horse. Not qua dog, not qua anything else. As a matter of fact, you say, if I injure the horse, it is true that I'm deteriorating him or her uh, as a horse. But actually, I may be improving that object out there qua something else, uh, like uh, qua glue. And if I injure the horse sufficiently, I only chop it all up and do all sorts of other things to it, then I have very much improved that 
substance out there qua glue. And finally, I put him in a jar and sell him in a hardware store, right? So it's necessary in making value judgments to keep in mind the context, to keep in mind the frame of reference in which we're making our value judgment, in which we're making our normative judgment. Qua horse, not qua glue, not qua lampshade, not qua dog meat, right? Dog food, qua horse. But if you're going to say that, if you're going to say that, ah, oh, we need a frame of reference, we need a context, you're saying, in effect, that what we need is a, a standard. for making this judgment. But of course, we already knew that. If I'm going to make a normative judgment, if I'm going to say the horse is improved, I must have a standard by which to say the horse is improved, as you already know. By the same token, if I'm going to say that the horse is deteriorated, I need a standard by which to make that judgment. What is the standard? Well, what is the standard by which you judge horses? What is the standard by which you judge dogs? That's the next example. Well, just below uh, in the dialogue, Plato speaks of the proper virtue of man. You see, dogs are deteriorated in the good qualities of dogs. He says, and will not men who are injured be deteriorated in the proper virtue of man? Uh, I'll put that down. Proper virtue. What he's talking about is a standard. Well, the standard by which we judge horses is the nature of a horse. What is the standard by which we judge apples? What is the standard by which we judge anything at all? You remember in our discussion of normative language, I asked how are standards established? The answer was standards are established in terms of the nature of the thing being judged and respect for human well-being. If we're going to judge horses, the standard by which we judge them is the nature of horses. And you can't complain about a horse because it has a tail, because it is of the nature of horses to have tails. In a word, in a word, the standard by which we judge horses is a uh, horseness, horseness. You do an injury to a dog, what happens? You deteriorate the dog. Qua horse? No, no, of course not. Uh, qua dog. And what is the standard by which we judge dogs? Well, it's whatever it is to be a dog. Dogness. Whatever it is to be a dog. We appeal to the nature of the thing being judged. Now, he says, what happens when you injure a human type being? Deterioration. Qua horse? No. Qua dog? No. Qua human being. And what is the standard by which we judge human beings? If we're going to be consistent, then it's a uh, humanness. What it is to be a human. What Socrates ends up saying is that the standard by which we judge human beings, 
qua human beings now, special kinds of beings on the face of the earth. The standard by which we judge human beings is a unique standard, he says, it is the standard of justice. You want to know um, what counts as a good horse? You simply turn to uh, the concept of what it is to be a horse. The people who know these things are animal scientists, uh, physiologists, uh, uh, veterinarians, uh, who knows horses? Well, those people, I presume, have that knowledge so important to the Greeks of horses. So uh, if you want to know whether or not the horse that you're uh, thinking of buying is a good horse or not, uh, see a horse person. See somebody who knows horses. See somebody who understands the concept of horse mess. Say things to hear. Now, you want to judge a human being? Do you want to judge a human being as a human being now? You want to judge a human being in those unique qualities that distinguish human beings from other animals on the face of the earth. Socrates says, you want to know what the standard is? He says the standard is justice. So justice now, in this case, is a virtue. And it is the excellence it is the proper virtue of a human being. So when a human being is really good as a human being, then, according to this argument, that human being is just. And to the extent to which a human being deteriorates as a human being, to that extent, that human being becomes unjust. This is a very tricky sort of argument. And you might be tempted to say, with good reason, that uh, Socrates is pulling a fast one here. And on Monday, We'll talk a bit more about this because um, I need to ask you questions and uh, I presume that you need to ask me questions. What you need to keep in mind is that what Socrates means by justice in this case is that peculiar virtue, that peculiar quality, that peculiar excellence that uh, uh, is appropriate to human beings, by which we judge how well a human being is being a human being. Now, I'm going to leave it here, and I'm going to pick it up on Monday, because there are some things I need to say. But uh, I want you to see how this argument goes. In the remaining time, that we have this morning, I want to make, uh, I want to uh, elucidate one more doctrine of Plato's. And I can do only one more because they gave me only three sheets. I've said that uh, the standard by which we judge horses is horseness. By dogs, dogness, humans, by justice. That these constitute the standards. Plato holds a doctrine of what is, what is called the doctrine of forms. Forms. The Greek word is ideas. The Greek word for form is idea. Uh, 
and we have simply taken that word over in the English language, and you know what that word means. Plato argues in the following way. He says that there are really two realms, if I may use that word, realm. two realms of, what shall I say, reality, of, of what there is, all right? He says that there is the physical world with which we are all familiar. But he says that there is also another world what he calls the intelligible world. And he thinks this is as real, indeed he thinks it's more real than the physical world in which we uh, move about. The intelligible world. The intelligible world. The world of what he calls the forms. The world of what he calls the ideas. And that we have access we are down here, that we have access to this world just as surely as we have access to the world of space-time. <clears throat> that, that I can apprehend this intelligible truth, 2 plus 2 equals 4, that I can apprehend that intelligible truth just as well as I can apprehend uh, this um, pen, this magic marker. That, <clears throat> that I apprehend or I cognize or I come into contact with this physical object here by means of sight. Just look out there and there it is and I see it. But there's a sense in which I see that the product of two and two is four just as surely as I see uh, that, that this is a, a, a black uh, pen. Surely I see that. Not see in the physical sense, but see in the sense of understand. And he should say, he, uh, Socrates says, well now, uh, if you do understand that, if that is something you understand, then it's something, uh, you, you understand something, that the object of your cognition, the object of your seeing, the object of your apprehension is something but it's not a physical something. It's a, a concept. It's a concept. Two plus two equals four is a concept. It's an intelligible object. Nobody would say that the product of two plus two equals four are those black marks on that white sheet. Nobody would say that. This doctrine of forms of Plato's uh, is a very important doctrine. And I want to elucidate this on Monday as well as the argument uh, that I've just gone through. I'm looking at my watch to see how long I've been talking to you here. And uh, I think that uh, it may have taken some time to get us started and the bell may be about to ring. For all I know, I'm not talking to anybody at all right now. You all may have sneaked out a long time ago. Uh, but. Uh, if you have, you missed one hell of a lecture. For Monday, I would like you to finish reading the dialogue. 
excuse me, finished reading book one of the dialogue, book one of the dialogue, which ends on page 44. Finished reading the dialogue. Uh, I will briefly recapitulate uh, what I've done uh, here this morning, and we'll move on. Uh, have a nice weekend. Uh, enjoy our victory over uh, East Carolina, and I'll see you on Monday.